Okay, yeah, so that's, uh, let's start. Uh, welcome everyone to Dig for Gems. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, yeah, Biblical Hebrew Poetry, where we're gonna look line by line and analyze into the some of the poems in the Bible and just look for gems and treasures there that we can all enjoy together. This episode, episode eight, we're gonna look at Psalms 42 to 43. Um, I've titled it as a deer pants for water, so I miss church worship. Usually this verse goes, uh, so I uh, long for you, oh God, right? <clears throat> um, but yeah, this is, uh, we're gonna, let's get started. Uh, as usual, our goal is to just enjoy the richness of the text by digging deeper. Um, and then part of uh, this Psalms that we're looking at, we're gonna reflect on spiritual longings and particularly musical worship and just being close to God and in his presence. That's gonna be two of the major themes today. As usual, I'm gonna, this is recorded, gonna ask everyone to keep their audio muted. Feel free to also have your video uh, still on and then questions response, we'll save that for the very end or feel free to message us anytime. Uh, Irene and Voni on, uh, we're on the same team together and uh, we would love to keep chatting more and more about these wonderful things. Uh, sources today, <clears throat> looked at quite a handful of different commentaries, but the one I use more is uh, this one, Expositor's Bible Commentary called the EBC. Um, it's uh, written by Longman III and Garland. Uh, but yeah, at least 60% of the insights today are from my own personal reflections. So I'll ask everyone to engage in our own critical thinking and we'll let the text speak to us. One uh, we want to start with a readiness to dig. So this is why we dig. I believe that the Bible is God speaking to us. And so it is deeply personal and intimate. Um, God's word is not only profoundly beneficial, but necessary for life. The arrangement of every word has purpose and creative design. And that all scripture is filled with valuable and beautiful gems. And so the more we are convinced that there are invaluable gems, the deeper we will dig for gems. Uh, our, this is our outline for today. Um, just the, this teaching set portion will take uh, about 40 to 50 minutes, uh, but we'll look at the overview of Psalms 42 and 43 together as one song. Um, then we'll, in this Psalms, there's three stanzas in total. So we'll zoom into each of those. Then we'll have a time of musical reflection. And then um, that's when we'll, after that, we'll pause it, we'll stop the recording and then we'll go into our discussion. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to uh, invite Irene to open us in prayer. Sure. Let us pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, uh, for today, for giving us this opportunity to listen to your word, to meditate, to know more about you, and to know you deeper, um, and also to share with one another. So Lord, would you help Toby tonight and also help our hearts to be open to what you have to say to us today. Help us to listen and obey you. And yeah, Holy Spirit, just guide our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Irene. So here's a quick overview of what the whole Psalms is like. Um, I'm convinced that 40, chapter 42 and 43 are part of the same song. One of the reasons is because with uh, most of the Psalms have a heading. Uh, there are some exceptions, but most of them do have a heading. Uh, so we see a heading in chapter 42, but there's no heading for chapter 43. Um, and also there are uh, three times where there's a large section that are identical. And so I've listed them, I've uh, titled them as choruses. So we'll see the exact same chorus three times, uh, twice in chapter 42 and also in 43. An overview of what the whole Psalms is about. <clears throat> Yeah, it's uh, the psalmist has a deep spiritual longing to worship God in the temple, but for some reason he is not able to. And we could, uh, yeah, like explore what are some of those reasons. But yeah, at the same time, the enemies mock him and say, where is your God? And that kind of implies that your God is nowhere. Um, and so these words deeply disturb the psalmist's minds. And each time he recalls these words that the enemy says, he goes into deeper and deeper sadness. Um, <clears throat> until it feels like just like a crushing feeling for him. And so we'll see this motif played out in each of the stanzas also. Only at stanza three, the psalmist remembers that God can lead him back to the temple and therefore he will again praise God. That's what he longed for in the beginning that he couldn't have, but there will be a time when he can praise God again. 
And so by stanza three, his spirits are lifted again, and then it's very hopeful and joyful again. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, in stanza one and two, we'll see the this kind of topic of just like back and forth where the psalmist alternates between thoughts of worshiping God, and then he gets distracted by what the enemies are saying, the words that they're saying. Um, and in stanza three, he begins by recalling the hurtful words, but he finally remembers that God can restore worship, and so he is, he is lifted again. So the chorus, this is uh, the chorus, and it'll appear three times, and we'll look into the words in more detail. But yeah, uh, I'm just going to read it. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. <clears throat> in many senses, the chorus contains the entire plot line of all three stanzas. Um, so it's kind of like the entire song in miniature is captured in the chorus. It's really wonderful. Here's a chart with a br brief overview of uh, what we're looking at. Uh, stanza one is here in the blue, stanza two is red, and stanza three is on the right side. Yeah, so we start uh, seeing that um, in the beginning, the psalmist has kind of a deep longing uh, kind of emotions that come out. But each time he recalls the enemy's words, he just goes sadder and sadder. And he spirals and just out of control into this deep crushing feeling. And so only by stanza three, he remembers that God can uh, restore temple worship. And so his spirits are lifted up again. Here's a table, also an overview. Um, Stanza one, stanza two in the middle, and then stanza three. Um, in each of these, I've outlined the major topics that are in, in the stanza. And what I just wanna highlight here is how there's red, yellow alternating, and that's uh, the enemy's words. He'll ponder upon the enemy's words, and then he'll ponder about uh, worship, and he'll alternate this back and forth between the stanzas. So that leads us with uh, stanza one. Um, so uh, we're going to start by reading it, but in keeping with the tradition, this is uh, from the Great Psalms scroll. We see that in the original text, it is written and given to us in paragraph format. And so we'll also read ours in paragraph format and allow uh, interpretation and allow, so allow some freedom in deciding, uh, discerning where the lines uh, split into different lines and where stanzas begin and end. So with that, I'd like to invite, uh, invite Volney to read for us. Stanza one. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul first for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence, oh my God. Thank you, Voni. That's in the NASB. And then I'll, I'll read it in Hebrew also. That's just the first stanza. Ka'ayil ta'alok al fugei ma'im, ken nafshi ta'alok alecha Elohim. Zama nafshi l'Elohim la'el chai, matayo vova ere pane Elohim. Haitali dumati lechem yoman v'layla, ve'amor alai kol ayom, aye Elohecha. Elias Kora Vesh Baha Alai Nafshi, Ki El Volbesak Adedem Ad Bet Elohim, Vakolina Vetoda Hamon Hogeg, Matishta Hachi Nafshi, Vatehemi Alai, Hochili Lelohim, Ki Od Odenu, Yeshuad Panai Velohai. So the structure of stanza one uh, kind of starts like this. Um, in the top section, uh, this, this stanza is really about the deep longing that the psalmist has to be in God's presence and to worship him. But it'll start us off with a metaphor and it uses a watery image um, to describe the longing. 
and then by the end uh, at the bottom here then the psalmist will tell us about the reality of what he is actually longing for what the metaphor represents and in the middle there's a small interruption where he recalls the enemy's words where is your god <clears throat> so as we said before, uh, most of the Psalms uh, start with a heading. And so we have a heading here uh, for the choir director, a mashkil for the sons of Korah. Uh, two things to note here is that this is a mashkil. Uh, we'll see this is a category of song. It comes from the word uh, shachal, which means prudence and wisdom. And so in the context of the genre, it's actually a like, contemplative song, a deeply reflective song. Uh, and we'll, we could actually see that uh, there are yeah, a large collection of Meshkiel songs in, in the Book of Psalms. Uh, why This is written uh, by the sons of Korah, and they are a group of uh, uh, Liv uh, Liv Levites, uh, so they're priests. And we'll see in the uh, Book of Numbers that they have a number of roles and responsibilities to serve God in his temple, in the tabernacle, in the Old Testament. Um, but here there's a section. Um, the context here is that the uh, Israel has just received a prophecy that they are going to win in the next battle that they fight. And so here it reads, then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel with a very loud voice. And so from this verse and also other verse, um, yeah, we uh, could speculate that the Korahites may have a role in leading musical worship in a temple, in the temple times. Uh, that may be their formal role, which is really, uh, interesting and very suitable because Psalms 42 is very much about the longing for musical worship also. So we start, um, we have the Hebrew on the left side and uh, the English on our right side. We'll see some color codings and they correspond to one another. Um, and I'll also have some notes on the bottom. As a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you. So the psalmist uh, very quickly in the beginning starts us off with a metaphor. Um, as the deer pants for water brooks, uh, if you could imagine a time when you were really thirsty, uh, maybe after a long hike or after running a marathon or something. Um, yeah, that's how much the deer pants for water brooks. Um, and it's searching for that water. And so in the same way, my soul pants and longs for God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. There's a fun word play here. So in the Hebrew uh, language, there is a phrase called uh, water of life. Um, and that is referring to fresh water. Um, it's water that is running. Uh, instead of stagnant, um, it's water that is clean, you know, instead of uh, polluted. Um, so that is what water of life is. So instead, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God, the God of life, um, implying that God is the one that is refreshing, um, that is so desirable. When shall I come and appear before God? Um, this, uh, yeah, so he's just describing his deep longing to be in God's presence. Uh, but this phrase here that I've underlined could be read in a different way. Uh, and the alternate way to read it is, when shall I come and see the face of God? And so the significance where God's face is related to his deep intimate presence. And the reason because this could the reason this has alternate reading is because the word here before um, in the Hebrew is the word face. Um, but it's very similar to English, how we use it also, that we can uh, use the word face to mean I'm facing a certain direction, or it could also refer to my face. Yeah, and so in the same way, uh, yeah, there are two valid readings here. When shall I come and see the face of God? So then there's a big question. If the psalmist misses God so much, why don't he just go and see God, right? Why don't he go visit God? What is keeping him from doing that? Um, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? The phrase here, day and night and all day long, um, hints us that, you know, this is something that he's thinking about all the time. Um, and that is the phrase that these uh, other enemies are saying, where is your God? Uh, and it implies that his God is nowhere to be found as if his presence is not accessible. Um, and the irony is that instead of 
getting the fresh water that he longs for, he gets salty water in the form of tears that is his food. What he truly longs for, this is the physical uh, reality. Before he gave us a metaphor of a deer that passed for water, but in reality, this is what he is longing for. These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me for I used to go along with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. House of God is another word for a temple uh, with voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. So what the psalmist truly longs for is a time when he led musical worship in the house of God. Um, the, during these festivals, the, there would be large crowds, almost a little bit like a parade, but they would, uh, in celebratory music and worship and loud shouts and cheers, they would uh, progress slowly towards uh, walking towards the house of God in the temple. So he, what he misses deeply is the voice of joy and thanksgiving and also being able to worship God together with other saints. And so uh, that kind of leads us to uh, about to look into the chorus. <clears throat> but uh, there are some really interesting words that we'll want to uh, unpack also. Uh, this first word. So we'll learn some Hebrew words together. The first word we'll learn here is the word shachach. Uh, shachach. You kind of have to uh, um, like clear your throat a bit to make that sound, the guttural sound. Uh, so shachach. Uh, most literally means to bow down. If you could picture a, some, someone uh, in a prostrated um, posture, um, so the person is uh, kneeling, his knees are touching the floor, and his uh, face is face down, his arms are stretched out uh, in front of him, and so he's in this posture. Um, that is the shachach posture. Um, but uh, so literally that's what it means but figuratively it could also be used to humble yourself for example if you are before the presence of a king you will shachach and go into that posture to show you are uh, humbled but it could also be a posture for mourning uh, that someone who is deeply sad will be in that posture as they're praying and crying out to god <clears throat> so that brings us to the chorus why are you in shachach, O oh my soul? The irony here is that in the first stanza, the psalmist has said that he longs to be in worship. He longs to worship God. But now, while he's in this posture, he, it looks like from a, if you're, if you're looking at him from afar, you might even think that he is worshiping God in that shachach posture. But instead, he is in shachach because he is deeply saddened. You can imagine how when you ask him to lift his face, he might be having, you know, full of tears. And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. As we go into the other stanzas, then we'll unpack these more line by line. So that leads us to our first discussion question, number one. Uh, so a quick recap of stanza one. The psalmist longs to worship God in the physical temple in Jerusalem, but is not able to. So the question for us is, why is the psalmist not satisfied with worshiping God at home? What are the differences between worshiping at church and online? And how else has worship changed because of COVID? So I wanna invite you guys to uh, th uh, think about this. And then uh, when you have answers, feel free to type them into the chat in this uh, Zoom. Um, and I'll set a timer for uh, three minutes.
So that's our three minutes. I know for myself, I uh, I think of a time when, because at, at my church, they sometimes have a choir, particularly during spring and summer. Um, and then the energy there of just seeing other people worship God, it's really humbling. And then there's a part of that that's really um, almost like contagious, right? Like uh, you see other people worshiping God and that opens up my heart to want to worship God too. Yeah. I, I miss seeing the choir. That brings us to stanza two. I uh, titled this one, Waters That Crash and Enemies That Crush. So I wanna invite Voni to read uh, stanza two for us. Stanza two. My soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon, from Ma Missa. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves has rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the shattering of my bones, my adversaries reviled me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Thank you, Roni. And in the Hebrew, Alai nafshi tishtokhach al ken eskora me eretz yarden ve hermon mahar mitza tohum el tohum kore la kol zinoecha kol misparecha ve galecha alai avru yomam yatzave adonai chazdo uvelai la shiro imi tefila la el chayai omra la el sa'i lama shachatani lama kodel elech berachat zayev beretzach so I put a star here to show where we are <clears throat> and we'll see um, that the psalmist will continue to spiral into deeper and deeper sadness each time he recalls those enemies' words, where is your God? So uh, very beautifully crafted. Stanza two shares many uh, features um, from stanza one. Uh, stanza one, we started with a watery image of the deer panting for water. Stanza two will also start with a watery image. Uh, then we have a midsection that has a motif of day and night, something that he thinks about all the time. And then, um, then we'll end with the, yeah, the session there. But then, uh, so some of the words um, that are in the last section of stanza one have been uh, repurposed into stanza two. So we'll see these two Hebrew words again. Um, similar to stanza one, uh, it starts with a metaphor. So just remember that everything we'll read in the first few verses are a metaphor and they uh, represent the reality of what he is uh, experiencing, which he'll talk about at the end of stanza two. So here we have the same word, shachach, which means to bow down, the posture where you're just completely face down on the ground with your knees. Um, so my soul is in shachach within me. Therefore, I remember you in the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. So, in stanza one, the psalmist remembers the time when he was in a wonderful festival, uh, getting ready to praise God together as they go towards the temple. Um, but here it's the opposite. Um, they are, instead of being close to the temple, they, he recalls God from the mountains, which is somewhere really far away. Uh, the peaks of Hermon, they're somewhere uh, in the far north. Um, and 
far north and slightly outside of Israel. And the land of Jordan is uh, so is is not um, depending on where the time is in history and which era. Um, the land of Jordan uh, may not even belong to the country of Israel. So they might be in an enemy territory at then also. Um, but either way, it is a, a land that is a place that is very far away. Um, so to get from Jordan to Israel, they would have to cross uh, this uh, big Jordan River. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the phrase before, we can picture that the psalmist is perhaps somewhere in the mountain right now. And so he says, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. Uh, this sounds a bit cryptic, but the word deep here, um, usually it refers to the deepness of the ocean, uh, like the deep abyss of the ocean. But in other parts of the scripture, it can also refer to streams and rivers, which is very appropriate if, uh, if the psalmist has placed himself in the mountains. So it's, uh, it could read something like, uh, streams call out to other streams at the sound of your waterfall. So if you can imagine yourself uh, going on a hike, uh, we have a lot of hikes in, in Vancouver. Um, and then as you're, uh, as you're going through the hike, sometimes there's different streams that you'll pass by and you'll hear the sound of that kind of rushing water. And then as you go closer and closer to the waterfall, that water uh, cra crashing sound just uh, gets louder and louder too. And so that's kind of what he's describing, that as he's in the mountains, he's surrounded by different uh, sounds of streams just calling out to one another as if he's surrounded by them. And all your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The word breaker here is quite significant. It comes from the, it's the word uh, mishbar that comes from the word shabar. Shabar means to break and shatter something. So if you have a clay pot and you dropped it, then the pot is shabar, you know? Um, and so what the breakers are is referring to the ability and the forcefulness of these waves that have the ability to break him over. And so these are the, they're not, uh, they're not soothing waves. These are uh, destructive waves that are rolling over him and crashing into him. So comparing with stanza one, uh, we had the sound of the crowds worshiping together where he's surrounded by all these uh, people that are in the same mind to worship God. But in stanza two, we start off with a metaphor of being surrounded by waves and he'll go into detail what these sounds actually are, what the reality is for him. In stanza one, he is passing through the crowd of worshipers with the word avar, but in stanza two, it is waves that are crashing over him. Uh, the irony is that in stanza one, he is deeply thirsty for water uh, and he couldn't find any except for his own tears, which are the little bit of salty water. But in stanza two, suddenly there are too much water He's getting these majestic, destructive waves that are passing over him. Then we come to the midpoint, also with the same motif of day and night. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night. If there is something that we should meditate on day and night, it shouldn't be what the other enemies are saying. We don't want those uh, kind of thoughts to be part of your um part of your daily life. And instead, uh, the right things to think about is God's loving kindness, and that can move us to respond with worship. Hence, uh, his song in response to his loving kindness. And so the psalmist continues, a prayer to the God of my life, I will say to God my rock. So here, in the first part of the metaphor, we saw that there are these crushing waves, um, crushing and destructive waves, but, and here is the physical reality of what he's referring to. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy as a shattering of my bones? My adversaries revile me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? In stanza one, we saw, actually saw this exact, uh, exact phrase. These two lines are identical to the ones in stanza one. Um, but in stanza one, he only spent two lines to recall what the people are saying. But in stanza two, he spends up to seven lines to recall how hurtful these words are. 
And so we see that the metaphor of being surrounded by sounds of water, that's actually the sounds of enemies that are saying, where is your God? As if they're saying that over and over again to taunt him. And so this brings us to almost uh, the chorus of the, yeah, this second time. Uh, so uh, first time we looked at the word shachach, which means to literally bow down, but can also figuratively mean either to humble yourself or to be in a posture of mourning. The other word that we'll learn now is hama. Uh, it means a literal roaring and mumbling sound. So I, it's kind of like a white noise. So if you're, um, if you're in the streets, a really busy street, and there's a lot of cars, and that's kind of traffic and sound is hama. Um, if you are at a Chinese dim sum restaurant in the afternoon on Sunday or Saturday, then you'll hear all these people talking and then that kind of noise of the crowd is hama. Um, also um, here, um, we'll see that other parts of scripture actually uses the word hama often to describe the sea that the waves, that kind of white noise of waves crashing over onto the beach, that is the hama also. And so while it literally refers to this kind of white noise, um, figuratively, if your heart state is in hama, then it's describing uh, the opposite of peace and quiet, yet that, um, that emotionally, that person would be really disturbed or troubled. But it could also have a positive tone to it. It could figuratively mean to say a prayer. Uh, back then in the in Bible times, when they prayed, they didn't uh, think it, but they instead they spoke their prayers out loud. They might be in a posture of worship or uh, just meditation, but then they when they're praying, they're actually saying words. So you can imagine in a temple where there are many other people that are also praying, you'll kind of hear um, the mix of different words, and that is also Hama. And so we're ready for the chorus the second time. Why are you in shachach, meaning bowed down, O oh my soul? And why have you become hama within me? Uh, so hama here, it's used to, he's referring to his sadness, his, um, that his heart state is in hama. He is very disturbed and upset um, as he's thinking about the enemy's words. And this is very, um, it actually corresponds really well with the theme of stanza two, that he is, um, his metaphor was being surrounded by different sounds of streams. And his reality is that he's surrounded by enemies' words. And all these words together cause Hama to be in his heart. And so that's why he's become disturbed within him. And so the chorus continues, hope in God for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So that leads us to our discussion question number two. A quick recap. The psalmist remembers the enemy's words and spirals into deeper and deeper sadness. So the discussion question now is, why is the phrase, where is your God, so hurtful back then? And what do non-Christians say about your God today? And the third question, what are the differences between worshiping God in a country that is open to worshiping God and in a country that persecutes those who worship God? So I'll set a timer for three minutes and feel free to uh, type your responses into the chat.
Yeah, thank you, you guys, for your response. Um, yeah, I, one of the themes that I'm seeing is that uh, that a lot of non-Christians actually say nothing, and I think that in some ways could also be just as hurtful. Is that they don't acknowledge that my God even exists and that He is real and that we do have a relationship with Him. So we'll go into stanza three. <clears throat> I've titled this one, Enemies Darkening Words and God's Leading Light. So I invite Voni to read for us. Stanza three. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling place. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre, I shall praise you, O oh God, my God. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Thank you, Tony. Shafteni Elohim, veriva vivi mi koilo chasid, me ish milma ve avla tafloteni, ki ata elohe meuzi, lama zanachtani, lama kode et halech ba la chatsayev, shalach orcha ve amitecha, Hema yanchuni, yaviuni el hal kod shecha, ve el mishkanotecha, ve al voa el misbeach elohim, el el simchat gili, ve adcha ve chinor, elohim elohai. Ma tishtachachi nashi, u ma tehimi alai, hochili lelohim, ki od odenu yeshuat panai velohai. So here we saw how the words that the enemies say, Where is your God? This phrase hurts him and he is spiraling into deeper and deeper sadness that he keeps remembering them. Uh, but stanza three is very hopeful. We'll see this upswing. Similar to uh, the, the last stanza, um, stanza three also has a lot of similarities with stanza two. Uh, one of them is that it starts with, uh, there's a section of uh, praying to God, and then it leads to, but then he uh, remembers the, the, the hurtful words of the enemy. And so stanza three has the same thing, starts with a prayer and then a focus on the enemy's words. We'll actually see some of the wording being identical, but we'll explore into that. And then some of the words here that are used to describe the metaphor, har tsinor gal, um, these are uh, repurposed as he talks about the leading light and the effect of God and his ability to restore worship. <clears throat> Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against the nations, against the ungodly nation. So previously, um, when, when he recalls the words, where is your God? It seems like there might be one enemy or maybe two enemy that are surrounding him. But now he identifies an entire nation, perhaps that he is placed in a country that does not worship God or just in his immediate uh, circle. He is also surrounded by people that do not acknowledge uh, worship his God. The word here, ungodly, is the word in Hebrew, lo chasid, and that is a uh, chesed means love, the covenant love of God for his people. Um, and then lo chasid are people that are not in covenant relationship with God. And so in modern day times, um, yeah, we, we uh, could think about what that means for. So here comes uh, my favorite portion of this whole Psalms. Um, so in stanza two, uh, recall how um, instead of using two lines, the in stanza two, there's seven lines that lead up to this phrase, where is your God? The phrase that he finds so hurtful and he has seven lines to describe it. Here in stanza three, he actually starts with the exact same opening. Why have you forgotten me? Instead, why have you rejected me? 
why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And so you can imagine that he is starting to spiral in the same way and his dark thoughts are starting up again. But instead, he actually doesn't finish his thoughts. He Three lines in, he actually gets interrupted and he doesn't finish his seven lines that lead that would end with, where is your God? He doesn't go there. And what does he get interrupted with? We'll see in the next verse. Um, but the word of uh, interesting word here is the word mourning. In the Hebrew, it's koder, which means to grow dark. And so literally it would read, why have you rejected me? Why do I grow dark because of the oppression of my, the enemy? And so instead here he says, oh, send your light the light that can, ref, uh, that can reverse the darkness and send your truth, let them lead me. Um, before he used to lead musical worship into the courts, into the temple, but now he's saying, God, you lead me back to your temple so that we can worship you again. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre, I shall praise you, O God, my God. In the, in the previous verses, he remembers how there was a time where he really cherished worshiping God, but then it's as if that is nowhere to be found and he could hardly picture it anymore as he just keeps uh, getting distracted um, and he keeps recalling the enemy's hurtful words. But now in this verse, he's finally able to almost see the full picture um, of a time when God can restore his worship and he can go to the altar. And so the word here, all, all in all, is very uh, full of joy again. Uh, in stanza two, we had the word waterfall, dinor, which is a metaphor for all the disturbing sounds that are surrounding him. But now he has chinor, which is the lyre. Instead, he'll make uh, sounds of worship to God. In stanza two, we had gal, uh, that is the waves, these waves that are crushing him. But instead, he will go to God in a, in a posture of joy and a posture of gil. So we're ready to look at the chorus again for the third time. Uh, so a quick recap, we have the word shachach, which means to bow down. And then we have the word hama, which means to uh, have the white noise, the rumbling sound, but it could also mean prayer. And the third word that we're gonna learn uh, and final word is yachal, and that is to wait, to hope, and to expect. <clears throat> um, yeah, the word hope here, is uh, it's quite different from our uh, modern understanding of the word hope. Uh, we'll look into that. Why are you in shachach, O my soul? Why have you become hama within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. So the word hope, um, it's not the kind of hope where you just have to, you know, cross your fingers and hope that something might happen. Instead, this kind of hope is you're expecting something to happen. Something will happen. You just don't know the timing of when, and that's why you wait. And so this phrase um, is really that I will wait for God. This time when we will get to praise him again, it definitely will happen in the future. And that hope is the kind of hope that can bring him great joy. For I shall yet praise him. The word here, praise, comes from the word odd, um, yad, which means hand. So the posture of praise is really when you throw your hands out into the air, um, that is the posture of praise, which is in stark contrast from the posture before when he was grieving and his arms were uh, flattened down onto the ground. The help of my countenance, the help here, the word yeshua, which means to save, it's also the same word as Yeshua, um, same root for Jesus. But the word here, save, the one who saves my um, countenance, the word in Hebrew is panai, for, uh, or pana, which means face. So his face has been, um, has been postured downward because he's in so much grief. But there is salvation that there is a person that can lift his face from grief and bring him joy. So he's saying, I shall praise the one who will rescue my saddened face. 
I will praise the one who is my God. There's a light uh, sound rhyme here. Um, the word again for I shall yet is odd. And then the word praise is also odd. I will praise is odd. So, uh, ki odd odenu. I will odd odd. Yeah. So that brings us to our final discussion question number three. Uh, this time we'll look into a New Testament application too. So to recap our entire song, the psalmist uh, says that he will long he longs to be in God's presence to see God's face, and he has great confidence that he will be brought back to the temple to worship God. Um, <clears throat> so the difficulty is that even in church today, none of us have really truly entered God's presence yet, nor have we seen God's face and we know what he looks like. So the psalmist longing, which is the same longing we have now, points us to a future time when we will enter God's true temple in heaven. So the question is, what makes meeting God face to face so desirable? Why does our entire being and soul crave to meet God? How does the chorus encourage us to persevere in this world until we meet God face to face? Timer for three minutes. That's our three minutes time. So some of the um, motifs I'm reading is that when we get to meet God, that's like, then we get to experience the fullness and the all of God. God's love that we experience partially now, we get to experience all of that when we meet him face to face also. Yeah, so that leads us to a time of music reflection. Uh, but this is also where I'll stop the video. Yeah, so thank you. <clears throat> 